Hello, everybody. My name is Pablo Wojcikowski, and I'm a faculty member at Northwestern University and director of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Thank you so much for joining us for today's uh, weekly virtual seminar of the Center. It's really, really a pleasure to have you all with us. The mission of the Center is to create knowledge about digital media and Latinx communities across the Americas. And today's speaker is a rising scholar in this space. Arthur Soto Vasquez is assistant professor at Texas A&M International University. Crystal Camargo, who's doctoral candidate in the Department of Radio, Television and Film at Northwestern University and an affiliate at the Center for Latinx Digital Media will introduce Arthur properly in just one minute. But before we do that, I would like to start by acknowledging that Northwestern is a community of learners situated within a network of historical and contemporary relationships with Native American tribes communities, parents, students, and alumni. It is also in close proximity to an urban Native American community in Chicago and near several tribes in the Midwest. The Northwestern campus sits on the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Ottawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Ho-Chunk nations. It was also a site of trade, travel, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other native tribes, and is still home to over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois. It is within Northwestern's responsibility as an academic institution to disseminate knowledge about native peoples and the institution's history with them. Consistent with the university's commitment to diversity and inclusion, Northwestern works towards building relationships with Native American communities through academic pursuits, partnerships, historical recognitions, community service, and involvement efforts. Now let's go back to today's seminar and let me briefly say how will it will unfold. First, Crystal will tell us more about uh, Arthur's research and career in just one minute. Then Arthur will deliver uh, his seminar. After that, we will open for questions. Please enter your questions in the Q&A function of the webinar. Crystal will moderate and I will back up if necessary. At the end, we will deliver some closing remarks. Once again, many, many thanks for joining us. And without further ado, Crystal, the screen is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction, Pablo, and for the opportunity to introduce today's speaker, whose central themes of Latinx voters, politics, and media could not be any more timelier. Um, for the first time, the Latinx community is projected to be the second largest voting demographic, trailing only behind non-Latinx white people. Additionally, research shows that Latinx consumers between the ages of 18 to 49 are the most tech savvy demographic in the US, making this group one of today's most engaged and dynamic communities in the digital space. In other words, we are in for an exciting presentation that examines how digital spaces form US Latinx identity in politics, especially in elections as today. With that said, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Arthur Soto Vasquez, who is an assistant professor of communication at Texas A&M International University with a PhD in communication from American University and MA in media studies from the University of Texas at Austin and a BA in political science from St. Edwards University. Dr. Soto Vasquez is an interdisciplinary scholar, qualitative researcher and civic educator. Situated at the intersections of media studies, political communication, Latinx studies, critical race and ethnic studies, as well as sociology, Dr. Soto Vasquez research, um, excuse me, Dr. Soto Vasquez studies the relationship between digital media, popular culture, and identity making. He has presented his work at Oxford University, the University of Milan, Monterrey Institute of Technology, and numerous national conferences, such as the National Communication Association and Cultural Studies Association. Dr. Soto Vasquez has previously published award-winning research on digital privacy and presidential rhetoric regarding Latinx in the United States. His first book, which was published earlier this year by Rutledge, is entitled Mobilizing the Latinx Vote. In today's presentation, Dr. Soto Vasquez examines the recent history of shaping Latinx voting identity in the US, applying his analysis to this 2020 election. He argues that the US Latinx voters political identity is constructed from a top down corporatized perspective that commodifies Latinx identity through racialization, denationalization and homogenization. Without further ado, Dr. Soto Vasquez. Thank you, Crystal, for that really uh, nice and, and kind uh, introduction. And thank you, Pablo, for hosting us as well as Northwestern University um, and the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Let me go ahead and start my presentation here. Um, 
Let's see. There we go. Okay. So um, as has been mentioned already, uh, the title of my talk today is uh, Mobilizing the Latinx Vote, Media and Politics in the 2020 Election and Beyond. So thank you, you know, all of you for joining us, uh, uh, joining me today, essentially, to talk on Election Day about um, what to expect in terms of Latinx voting, um, what we've learned, what I've learned uh, in my study of it, and what maybe we can, um, you know, see in the future uh, and beyond, right? So um, I know we're all probably a little anxious about the results today, um, probably worried about what's going to happen, perhaps. Um, and hopefully, my goal of this presentation really is to set the stage for us to interpret the results um, and the discourse that emerges in the media afterwards about Latinx voting um, so that we can all be a little bit more uh, educated um, and have a more informed opinion on it. Um, and also, I think really my goal here is, as Crystal very nicely said, is to explain, I think, the ideological project of creating Latinx voting identity uh, in the United States uh, through those themes that, that she briefly mentioned and I'll get into later, uh, because I think that is actually um, the most important aspect of, of voting. So one thing that um, you may, oh, so I'm trying to, there we go. Okay. Um, one thing that you may have, have seen in um, news coverage uh, of coming through the, the, you know, these days before the election is uh, headlines like this. This is from Texas Monthly, a great uh, article on um, why uh, Latinos in Texas either vote uh, or don't, uh, what are some of the rationales? And I think some of them are actually quite compelling. It's a great um, article if you're interested in it. We've also seen uh, headlines like this, where uh, uh, this is, for, I believe, from Bloomberg, where it said, you know, some in the Biden camp are kind of worried about turnout uh, among uh, African-Americans, Black voters, uh, as well as Latino and Latinx voters. Um, and that is a potential worrying sign. We can talk a little bit more about that in the Q&A if you want. Um, and then, of course, um, other uh, you know pieces. This is from the Atlantic, uh, talking about okay. Here is just um, sort of this. Uh, you know, a lot of liberals have this under uh, this question mark always about well, why is there this significant uh, chunk, at least 30, 20 to thirty percent of Latinos um, who who still support uh, Donald Trump uh, despite, as they believe, all of these sort of racist um, and uh, you know other aspects of of the of the essentially the last four years. Um, and, and you know, there's been talk about this too. Um, one thing that almost always consistently emerges, no matter when you talk about Latino voters, uh, Latinx voters, is this metaphor of the sleeping giant, right? And everybody's always wondering, okay, when is it going to awake? Is it, has it been awoken? Um, and, and what will American politics look like once uh, Latinx voters take their sort of full center stage um, in the voting electorate? And um, there's a great book on this, by the way, by Christina Beltran uh, that really delves into sort of what this metaphor means um, that I highly recommend. Um, but essentially, uh, just looking at some of the data over the last few years, um, in 2018, it was roughly 70, 30 spread. I mean, you can see the numbers there. Um, most, for the most part, the polls in 2020 look roughly similar uh, between Democrats and Republicans. Uh, now, of course, um, there's, Always issues, of course, with polling uh, Latino voters, and in particular Latinx voters, uh, probably due to language, uh, access, uh, stuff like that. So happy to talk more about that in the uh, in the Q and A if you want. Um, and and so in 2016, the numbers were a little bit slightly lower for Clinton. Um, however, they did tick up as a percentage of the overall voters, essentially, um, in the voting population. So that's an important point, point. Uh, and that's one thing I'll be looking for, sort of in in the coming days. If is less so that the spread 70-30, I think that'll roughly stay the same, um, but uh, will there be a higher percentage of the total population that is Latinx? So you can ask, you can answer the question yourself if you think the sleeping giant has awoken um, or, or not. Um, but a lot of the sort of hopes about certain states going one way or the other, Texas in particular, Arizona, another one, um, rely sort of on this belief that Latino voters are a sleeping giant ready to be um, awoken. Um, here's just a couple more graphs that show uh, visually, I think some of these changes, you see a huge increase, for example, um, in, in 2018 uh, for Latino voters, Latinx voters, um, and uh, generally, although all groups um, sort of increased their participation in the 2018 midterms. And, and like I said, you know, if Democrats hope to change Texas, the idea is it's going to be the Latino Latinx vote that does it for them. I sort of maybe have some doubts about that, perhaps. Um, I can share them again in the Q&A. 
Um, but uh, let me actually go ahead and get into a discussion of, of what I researched and what my book um, essentially is about. And essentially, it kind of comes from this, you know, journey, an intellectual journey I've had uh, thinking about Latinx voters um, over over quite a while. I mean, I've been studying kind of this stuff since I was in, uh, an undergraduate. Uh, you know, when Obama first came to uh, came to power uh, and, and was elected, and there was this kind of you know. Uh, hope that this multi-ethnic, multi-racial coalition would be the future of American politics. And I was always, you know, in, in undergrad and uh, graduate school, I was thinking, okay, all right, how can we predict that why Latino voters did this or not or whatever? Um, but really, when I got to actually, you know, researching and figuring out what I wanted to study, um, I started to rethink sort of my assumptions. Um, and, and the outcome of that is, is this book that, uh, you know, Crystal mentioned, Pablo mentioned, and what I learned essentially is that, uh, to me at least, it was less important about, okay, why do Latinx voters vote a certain way? Uh, what percentage increase may happen next year? There's plenty of good work on that in the field of political science. But rather, I started to become a lot more interested in how the organizations that are focused on getting Latinx voters out to vote, um, talking to them, speaking to them, direct, you know, sort of addressing them as a voting audience um, we're actually constructing a Latinx identity um, that has a lot of implications, I think, for both politics, culture, media, um, et cetera. And in that construction process, um, there are sort of uh, corporate elements at play. There is marketing. Uh, digital media is very much implicated. Um, the news media uh, has a relationship. I don't know which way it goes yet. I'm not a quantitative scholar, but we'll talk about that um, perhaps later. Um, and all of these sort of forces are converging on this kind of singular identity of the Latinx voter in the United States. Um, there's a lot of interest to play um, and there's certainly a lot of, of stakes uh, in, in coming elections. And so that's essentially what I'm gonna be talking about today, less so, okay, if I think they're gonna be 30% Republican or 31%, however, um, although those trends are certainly uh, implicated nonetheless. Um, so I said, like I said, I decided to start looking at these uh, Latinx organizations that mobilize uh, voters. Uh, of course, there's historical ones like LULAC. I mean, we're talking, you know, uh, sort of an 80 year, 90 year legacy at this point for this organization. Um, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus obviously is engaged in this work too. Um, Voto Latino is probably the sort of the quote unquote new kid on the block. Um, although there's some newer players that I don't cover in the book, especially here in Texas, like Move uh, and Jolt. Um, and you may have seen them around your campuses perhaps. Um, I've also, I also studied several other organizations, but these are uh, some of just a sample of them. Um, and like I said, the book really focuses on their efforts um, to mobilize voters and what that means rather than uh, discussions over how, how much or, or why uh, voters choose a certain thing. Um, let me briefly discuss essentially sort of my procedure here of how I um, did this work and before I get into the results. And, and this might be of interest for some of, uh, I believe there's some of my students in the audience um, in my qualitative research methods class. Um, and one of the goals I sort of set out for myself when I was doing this work was to not just look at sort of one part of the process. Uh, I really wanted to um, try to trace the production of Latinx identity in multiple venues and spaces, whether they be online, offline, or, or somewhere in between. Um, and so in terms of methodology, uh, I used a, really a, a mixed approach. Um, and, and I really did try to trace essentially how ideas and ideologies and discourses emerged in one space and then kind of filtered their way through all these other aspects. So um, I did some participant observation at, um, you know, at uh, national conferences of these organizations to see um, what groups were at the table, quote unquote, who were really influential players, um, how did sort of um, rhetoric and discourse emerge sort of in those panels, which then was filtered through um, either social media, the news media, um, or uh, sort of the elite uh, leaders in these organizations, how they understood their audience. Uh, of course, I've also collected uh, through a content analysis, uh, digital media, right? You see uh, George Lopez here uh, featured in the Voto Latino Post. Uh, I did that sort of traditional media analysis. Um, I also spoke with, uh, interviewed, uh, did some um, observation at offices of the leaders of these organizations. Uh, and that helped me sort of connect the dots, right? Between back to these live events um, and also the digital media they produced. And then new for the book, which was adapted for my dissertation, I also looked at how the news media coverage um, of the 2018 midterm elections talked about and framed Latinx voters and tried to make some connections there. 
uh, between the themes I observe um, generally and throughout all these processes. And so I, I think this methodology, um, you know, for those for those of you thinking about doing research projects, really helped me kind of take something that uh, wasn't just an artifact, you know, the digital media itself, um, but also kind of see the ecology of how it's produced, whether it be an official fora. Um, by the elite sort of uh, leadership of an organization, as well as um, how those uh, ideas uh, either, you know, sort of influence the news media, or, or perhaps it's the other way around, where the news media is influencing these frames uh, of Latinx voters. So I was really pleased with how this research, and it was a, a lot of fun too, so it's something I, I enjoy doing. So anyway, um, that's essentially kind of the approach I did in terms of um, getting to the results of the study. So um, let me let me discuss these essentially themes. Um, this is essentially if you have any takeaway from my talk, something that I really want to, to emphasize here. Um, and my position essentially is that um, these Latinx voting organizations are uh, crafting sort of a, a voting identity um, that takes Latinx identity uh, as this kind of like abstract phenomenon, right? It's not always clear who or what is a, a Latinx person in the United States and really distills it using these three processes. The first is that difference um, is, is minimized among different Latin American, Latino, Chicano, Mexican American, however you know, labels you want to use, all those differences are minimized uh, and sort of flattened into this new sort of Latinx voting identity. Uh, I talk a lot uh, in the book about this, but, but one instance in particular that you know, for those of you involved in sort of campus politics might, might find interesting, is that I talk about a hypothetical, hypothetical example of a wealthy sort of, you know, uh, South American woman who immigrates to the United States um, and a refugee from, say, Central America who also uh, comes to the United States, uh, perhaps is undocumented though. Um, they, they come to the United States, they raise their children here. And when both of their children go to, say, Northwestern University, Texas and International University, um, they'll both check the box that says, Latino, Latina, Latinx, right? They, they may go to an organization um, that sort of flattens their identity uh, at that level, right? And it disregards all of the uh, sort of the legal differences, racial differences, um, ethnic differences, national differences, um, and, and class differences, especially uh, between these groups. Uh, and so that's one process that I really uh, did emerge and I'll, talk, I'll spend some time talking about in more detail. Uh, the second process, is denationalization, which is somewhat similar to the, the previous one, except that you see in these organizations an attempt to shed perhaps the, the national identity of, of where these folks uh, have come from, where their ancestors have come from, um, and they're sort of renationalized as, as US Americans, right? And so I'll talk about some of the instances of this, but you see this a lot in uh, Dreamer rhetoric uh, around folks who uh, have uh, are participated in the Dream Act. Uh, deferred action, et cetera. Um, and, and also generally, you know, this attempt to create uh, sort of American Latinx voters, right? LULAC, I mean, historically was always a part of this. Um, and so it's another theme, I think, that these organizations are participating in. And then lastly, uh, racialization, uh, which what I mean essentially here is that Latinx voters are then cast as a part of this larger constellation of coalition of people known as sort of people of color. Um, these are, you know, things, by the way, that we take pretty much for granted. We just assume are sort of natural. Um, and, and that's one thing I really try to do in this work is actually uncover, okay, what are the, the sort of the projects going on here uh, in terms of shaping voters to uh, naturally be in sort of one uh, constellation uh, of voters. In, in this case, uh, Latinx voters are often paired alongside uh, Black voters as sort of like conjoined, uh, perhaps, um, as, as targets uh, of voting, and uh, it's assumed that sort of they will act similarly, and, and that's a big assumption, actually. Um, and so that racialization into the American racial, aid, racial system, the U.S. American racial system, um, is, is another theme, I think, uh, of this work. Uh, and so I wanted to explain those three things at the beginning, um, because it's something that I'll be uh, re continually referring to um, throughout um, the talk. Okay. Um, so, as I mentioned, part of my work was also, um, you know, doing interviews with folks. And before I actually get into the discussion of these three themes, I do want to briefly mention um, that the folks that I, I ended up interviewing um, are not your typical sort of, um, 
it's not what you might imagine in a project about Latinx voters. Um, I didn't actually talk to any Latinx voters. Uh, so um, instead, I talked to the people who are behind the production process, who make this content for these organizations that are leaders in them. Um, they were often communication directors. They were often digital media experts. They have some experience in, in, in campaigns, et cetera. And what they end up comprising, I argue, is a professional political class uh, it's a small minority, uh, to be sure, of the Latinx population in the United States. Uh, but nonetheless, they do share a lot of similarities um, to uh, the professional and managerial class more broadly in the United States. And some of those features um, are that they are all highly educated, um, often very fluent uh, in English, sometimes uh, solely English, not always English and Spanish. Um, they, uh, their experience often comes more so from uh, political campaigns and other civil society organizations and less so from activist uh, backgrounds. So they grew up sort of uh, going to, um, you know, very prestigious universities, um, getting involved in sort of professional organizations at that stage, uh, and then moved into these positions in these organizations, either directly from college or graduate schools, but many of them also have graduate degrees, um, or through, um, you know, either uh, political campaigns. A lot of the uh, folks I talked to were alums of the Clinton campaign, and partly her loss meant a gain for these organizations because they absorbed a lot of the Latinx talent uh, from them. Um, and so I think setting the stage for who uh, comprises this, the leadership of these organizations is important, um, not just because, you know, because these products aren't made in a vacuum, right? People who make them come to them with a, um, a background and a sort of orientation um, that's, I think, in a large part, class and education uh, driven as well. Okay. So let's get into the different uh, themes. And this is essentially the remainder of the talk. Um, I'll, I'll talk about each of these three um, in, in a little more detail, some instances of them that I observed uh, that I want to contextualize for you. Um, once we wrap that up, I'll open it up for questions, which I'm sure um, you'll have some either related to this or, or what, what might happen um, later tonight slash this week. Um, so let's talk about minimizing difference. Uh, one of the predominant trends I noticed in, um, in sort of this communication, right? So. Um, a lot of the literature about uh, Latinx identity, Latino identity in the United States, uh, in terms of media, has often focused on the question of representation, right? How are, you know, uh, Latinos being represented in the media, right? What are these, these sort of crude stereotypes, uh, you know, the, the spicy Latina, right? The, uh, you know, the greaser, right? These, these crude, very crude stereotypes uh, that uh, Charles Ramirez Berg has talked about, for example. Um, instead, what I focused on, I do talk about that stuff, though, in the beginning of the book, but instead, in my observations um, with um, these, these folks who run these organizations, it was more so focused on how is this identity um, either being um, filtered through um, or reinterpreted in elite networks. And so it's less a focus on, you know, mass media, right, and more so on these uh, network-based uh, organizations that then create their own digital media. However, even though it is at a much smaller reach, uh, could perhaps be more influential in the communities that they operate in. Um, one thing that, that was really interesting to me was that a lot of these folks in these organizations um, use uh, their Twitter networks as a means to learn about um, their audiences. And so this becomes sort of a shorthand heuristic um, essentially for getting kind of taking the temperature, if you will, uh, of the Latinx uh, voting population. Um, of course, there, there are some issues with this, right? Um, first of all, we know that, or if you don't know this, sorry, um, Twitter is, is not representative of the United States population. Um, it's uh, people that use it tend to be uh, more highly educated, more tuned into politics, just care more about politics. Um, and so using this kind of heuristic to learn about your audience um, can actually reproduce uh, some of the, the sort of class dispositions that these folks already bring to the table. Um, and, and exactly this point, right? The networks themselves on online networks are reflections of their own you know, sort of class position. I, I clearly remember somebody I spoke to saying, you know, I think about what my, my dad might think, my mom might think, their average, you know, sort of Latinx voters, and that's what I base my decisions on when I craft a, an organizational message or a digital media product. I, I think I'm speaking to them, for example. Um, and so those like, wider experiences are, or sorry, those, ex those personalized experiences are crafted onto the wider community. That's, I think, the first example uh, of how uh, difference is sort of flattened um, into, in, in this organizational communication. Um, 
Second thing is that here's a, an example of a tweet uh, from Voto Latino congratulating Veronica Escobar, who's uh, my congressman in El Paso, uh, and Silvia Garcia, who was also elected, I believe, at Houston in Texas. Um, two of the first Latina congresswomen um, elected from Texas, actually two of the first, sorry, um, in, 20, in their primaries in 2018. Um, and uh, this is an instance, I believe, where the narratives of sort of election uh, success uh, are tied to the success overall of the Latinx community. So this is a sense, essentially a, rep, uh, a representational argument. Okay, these folks got in, they represent us, uh, and that's a victory for all of us. Um, and of course, as, as you as you may may know, this is not essentially a material advancement necessarily for the community. It's it's sort of uh, um, it's a, it's, it's actually that a representational. Um, and so this is something that you often see in a lot of Latinx media is that, okay, a, a victory of one of their members um, or a candidate is used to represent victory sort of, or, or progress for the whole community as well. You, you can agree or disagree with if that's true or not, but certainly something that they uh, tend to believe in. Um, I, I often use these terms interchangeably, minimization of difference or homogenization. They mean the same thing, um, but you end up seeing sort of these trends in um, from these organizations and their digital media and the people who do them translated into um, their um, into news media coverage essentially. So you often see um, these terms in news media like uh, Latino voters, Latinx voters are a rising demographic force um, that will eventually put the Republicans out of business apparently. Um, and and often the issue that is symbolically tied 100% of the time to Latinx voters is immigration. Um, here's a couple of examples uh, from some of the news media coverage I, I captured related to this theme, um, where in Orange County, we went from a predominantly conservative area um, in within a few, uh, within the decade, essentially, to a, um, a where, where, you know, a lot of Republican congressmen left, lost their seats, congresspeople, sorry, um, and uh, at least these writers attributed to the growing, you know, Latino population. Um, same thing here where they're attributing uh, losses in the Sun Belt, and this is the media, um, to um, essentially Trump's rhetoric turning off uh, Latino voters. Um, and so the idea is that Trump's rhetoric on immigration, something that pushed Latino voters um, away from him. And you know, if, we'll get into this later perhaps, but the sort of the exit polls don't really show that. Um, it's sort of a kind of uh, a, a fantasy in a way uh, there really hasn't been a lot of change, I think, from, we won't see a big change from 16 to, to 20 uh, in terms of Latinx voters um, voting Republican, and we may actually see a slight increase, uh, perhaps. Um, but that'll remain to be seen. Okay, uh, let, let me talk a little bit of some instances of denationalization, the second theme of the three. Um, the first is that uh, this, is, this was almost always universally done in all of these uh, organizations and their rhetoric in their online media, is, is that the dreamer as a uh, as a subject, the, this is it's sort of the undocumented person who's brought here as a child, went to is, is or is went to college, um, is sort of held up as a emblem of, of the, the Latinx voting identity, right? And so they're set, they're often said, okay, you they can't vote, so you need to vote for them, right? And they, you know this consistent phrase came up of um, the, they're all in America, they're sorry, uh, they're American in all but paperwork, right? So in other words. Um, you know, these are the, our ideal Americans. And there's been a lot of critical writing in, in the field about how holding these folks up as emblems of, of Americanness for this organization, for, for Latinos generally and Latinx voters uh, specifically, um, is actually problematic because then it shows that you have to be, go to college, you have to be productive uh, to, to be deserving of, of citizenship. And it ends up reinforcing sort of these neoliberal narratives uh, of citizenship. It's, it's sort of problematic. Um, also, this was also uh, very interesting as well. In official forums, um, especially um, at these major conferences, which are often sponsored by major corporations who really want to, um, you know, showcase that their brand is invested uh, in, in diversity uh, inclusion, uh, right? So this corporate corporatized uh, discourse of diversity and inclusion that um, they support and are, are working to uphold. Uh, Latinx people in the United States as productive members of society. So some of the big culprits here are Walmart, um, you know, Southwest Airlines, American Airlines, Pepsi, 
um, I would always walk around when I was at doing my some observation and just note the all the empty tables in the front bought by major corporate donors. Um, and in between kind of major speeches by politicians uh, and other leaders, they would almost invariably bring up somebody who started working at the floor, uh, shop floor in Target and worked her way up to um, middle management. And in that case, the uh, American dream rhetoric was used to reinforce the sort of uh, the goodness uh, of these corporations in uh, helping Latinos move into the middle class. Um, and so this corporatized identity is another aspect of this denationalization, I believe, um, that that's, is really noteworthy and something that uh, we'll continue to see play out, I think, in, in voting trends moving forward. Um, here's an example of a tweet, right, um, about the Dreamers, for example. Um, and I mentioned earlier, you know, the, uh, the worthy immigrant narrative. You see this very uh, prominent in some of the uh, online uh, media, for example, from these organizations where they say, okay, look, immigrants, undocumented immigrants pay more in taxes than these corporations. Um, but the message essentially is that, um, you know, they are, are paid into the system and therefore sort of invested in it and they should be rewarded in some way for their sort of loyalty. Um, and that sort of turns their identity or their participation in the system into a primarily uh, economic one. Um, the other thing I just noticed uh, broadly is that there's very little Spanish in any of um, these organizations um, sort of messaging. And I, and I think this is partly because of the legacy um, started by LULAC, for example, where um, the Americanness of Latinos is really tried to emphasize and they don't really use Spanish uh, because they don't want to present um, sort of uh, Latino voters as, as foreign. They want to say, no, we're American and we're invested in this system. Um, and like I said, um, you, these, are, these are legacies certainly of, of framing Latinx as voters. This is quite different actually. This is one case where this theme um, actually is contrasted in the news media. Um, the news media typically uh, has, has a legacy of framing Latinx voters as foreign or different. Um, and it certainly was not as common in 2018, but um, there's some interesting aspects of it that do emerge uh, when talking about Latinx voters in Florida. Uh, and so whenever you hear news coverage in the coming days about how Latinos or Latinx voters uh, behaved in Florida this cycle, uh, be aware of some of these kind of constraints that are a little different than say, for example, Texas um, or California. Um, and so here's an example of that, uh, talking about how uh, you know, for some reason, right, Latinx voters in Florida are different um, than those in, in Texas and, and uh, California. And the example essentially, or the reason why is because there is a large Cuban immigrant uh, uh, population that uh, because of the revolution, essentially have a different class perspective and ideologically have almost always supported Republicans. So it shouldn't be surprising essentially um, that they still do support um, uh, or it, the split is a little bit more even than 70-30, in other words. Okay, uh, last theme here, and then I'll, I'll sort of wrap up. Um, and essentially, this is the topic of, okay, how are uh, Latinx voters being racialized uh, as a part of the uh, voting population more broadly in the United States? Um, and so this kind of framing is very prominent, and it's, like I've said, it almost feels kind of natural, right? We just assume it to be true. Um, uh, where that Latinos, Latinx voters are um, viewed as separate and distinct, first of all, from white and black Americans. Um, those should be capitalized, my apologies. Um, and they're put into association of this larger umbrella of people of color. Of course, this is interrelated with the uh, minimization of difference where, you know, essentially um, there is a ton of racial diversity in Latin America, as you all are, are aware, right? Um, but instead it's all flattened into this large, into this kind of overarching abstract uh, abstraction. Um, and, and this I think can also uh, potentially have some ramifications later on um, and may partially explain, I think, why some Latinx voters are still uh, stuck with Trump or, or sticking with them essentially. Um, I can explain that a little more if y'all are interested. Um, another thing too is that there is certainly a Mexican American hegemony in these organizations as well. Um, and all the conferences themselves that I attended in 2017 uh, were in the Southwest uh, of the United States. So like Arizona, Texas, California, um, and primarily attended by Mexican Americans. And so as the sort of largest group in this constellation, um, their own sort of uh, racial ideology uh, is sort of transplanted here as well, um, which is something that I talk a little bit more about uh, and can talk more about if you're interested. Um, okay, so um, this theme certainly was very common in the news media coverage. 
Um, Latinx voters were often cast as their own group, um, separate from other racial groups in the United States. You, I, I literally did a keyword search for Blacks and Latinos um, because that was a very common phrase. I'm not sure how many times it came up, but it was pretty, pretty common. Um, and this is really commonly done by mainstream pundits. So in, when I you know, analyze the news, a lot of it was from CNN talking heads, MSNBC talking heads. They really uh, repeatedly refer to this constellation. So in this case, we see something that has, um, you know, is a concurrent trend both in these organizations and in the news media um, that I believe kind of mutually reinforce each other. It's hard to say which way it goes otherwise, which, which, which element influences the other. Um, they're concurrent and they're both happening at the same time and they end up sort of reifying race, right? Race, race itself is a ideological project. It's a social construct. And we reify it by making it seem natural, of course, uh, in the media and in organizations where we just kind of view these things as the natural way of doing things. Um, now, um, this uh, here's your, uh, one example where Black and Latino voters uh, were part of the biggest shift uh, in Wisconsin in this particular article. Um, and so anyway, um, just to wrap up so we can start to get to some Q&A, um, one of the things I argue essentially in the book is that um, the features of mass media identity uh, construction where um, sort of these trends kind of emerged and, and these themes are not, you know, felt, they did not fall from the sky, I'm very much influenced by those who came before me, um, are now sort of being adopted by these Latinx leaders in these organizations. Um, and I think it is a, a part of a larger project, uh, which was mentioned in the introduction of myself, where I think Latinx voters and this identity is a little bit more akin to an actual uh, sort of the creation of a branded identity um, in, uh, to create a sort of marketplace um, for uh, loyalty, um, and to use that, that phrase, um, where, okay, if you, if you identify this way, you should vote a certain way. Um, and this is all, of course, reinforced and reified both by these organizations, legitimacy in the community, um, the corporatization of them were so that these ideas are then um, both influenced by corporate sort of discourses about, you know, inclusion and equity, um, but also, um, you know, given legitimacy by their, um, by their presence and sponsorship, um, and then, of course, reified, right, in the digital products that are created. Um, this is certainly an ideological project. Um, and the, the thing about ideological projects, as we will probably get into, is that um, the, the role of the actual uh, subject in them, or the voter in this case, um, is not as considered so much. You might be thinking, okay, I've talked a lot of, as you're listening, okay, you've talked a lot about these organizations, what they do, uh, how their, their ideas are transmitted in the news media, and where is the actual voter? And, and that's sort of my point here, that these conversations, these projects that are happening, um, you know, are, don't really engage too much with the difference that's actually present in the Latinx voting community in the United States. Um, and I think that's to their detriment, uh, uh, perhaps. Um, and, and part of the consistent trend that we see of, of either low voting uh, participation in total, or this consistent about 30% that do vote um, for, for Republicans or are gonna stick with Donald Trump um, in 2020. Um, and so I want you all, hopefully one takeaway beyond these broad themes is to be a little bit perhaps more critical, I think, of uh, this sort of branded identity where Latinx identity in the United States is becoming sort of a thing that you can try on and exchange, right? Uh, and so um, it's a, an abstraction away from, um, you know, what, um, what's actually real and authentic to people and to something that you can buy and put on when needed. Um, you know, I was, I was watching Coco last, uh, last night on Disney and I was thinking, wow, like they, they really did it, right? They took our culture and they repackaged it and sell it back to us, right? And maybe that's a little cynical, um, but I think we should all just be generally wary of that trend uh, as we move forward. Um, so anyway, thank you all. Uh, I'm gonna you know, stop sharing my screen and uh, open this up for some questions. And, um, and hopefully you found this all very interesting. And it's kind of, like I said, sets the stage for how we can interpret uh, Latinx voters moving forward. Thank you so much, Dr. Silva Vasquez, for such a great um, presentation. I have so many different questions, and at some point I was like snapping, and at other times I was like, ah, these brands. Yeah. <laughs> but my very first question is partly motivated by my own work because I look at language ideologies both in um, US English and Spanish language television, 
Um, you kind of started to get to this, but I wanted to know if like Voto Latino or the Congressional Hispanic Caucus um, kind of construct or speak or mobilize Spanish speaking Latinx audiences differently than their English language counterparts. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a really great question. And there's actually two things that I that I that I thought of as uh, you were saying that one, first of all, is, you know, I didn't find a lot of Spanish mobilization, um, to be honest. And I think that's baked into their theory about who is the ideal or, or the or the Latinx voter. And I didn't mention this. So thank you for, for bringing it up. Um, their approach is is one in which they believe that the people that are going to get Latinx voters to the polls are young, bilingual, um, highly educated, uh, digitally savvy people, um, the quote unquote new Latino, as, as uh, Chris Chavez talks about. And their theory essentially is that if you target them, um, sort of 20 year olds, 30 year olds, the, the yuppie types, right? They will then drag their, their parents and their grandparents, their abuelas, their tios, to the polls. Um, and uh, that'll be sort of the, 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 the that's the logic, right? Um, and so Spanish then is not used uh, primarily, I, I have seen it, of course, used as like kind of cultural signifiers or like, hey, we know this is going on. So it's kind of like a little trick. It's almost like, um, I don't know if you're familiar with like Jane the Virgin, right? Like the little drops of Spanish phrases in there. That's kind of what's going on, I believe. Um, and so that also relates back to the other points you made me think about, which is that a big aspect of their mobilization, especially Volta Latino, is using, um, is using celebrities. Um, people like Rosario Dawson, um, you know, folks who have emerged, just mostly on television, perhaps, um, um, to, uh, they believe, mobilize um, young voters. Wilder Valderrama, for example, I, I believe is on the board of Voto Latino. Um, and that was an explicit strategy that they, they told me about in their interviews. They said, look, we, we believe that using celebrities uh, will get millennials and now Gen Z, I'm presuming. I'm waiting for the, the Latinx TikTok star uh, to be used by these organizations. Um, and that's essentially what they believe. Um, and, you know, um, for anyone in the audience who has, you know, older relatives, um, they can probably share or at least reflect themselves how effective it is when, you know, you're you're back from college and you're trying to convince your parents or grandparents to vote or not vote a certain way. I mean, you know, it's 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 always sometimes a losing battle, sometimes not. Anyway, okay. What else? Thank you so much for that. I feel like you just described me in terms of their targeted population. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. And we certainly are, you know, we, we, uh, the, by virtue of being on this, on this seminar here, we are their target population. And it's sometimes it's hard to see ideology at play because we're, it seems natural to us, but you know, there's a lot of people that they're also missing out on perhaps. Sorry to interrupt. No, you're fine. Um, speaking about TikTok, I saw something a couple of days ago that was really interesting. It was like Spanish speaking um, Latinx, mostly of Cuban descent, trying to use the platform to create some misinformation for Joe Biden in order to like increase people to vote for Trump. And as you were outlining, about 20%, 20 percent, 20 to 30 percent of the Latinx voters from the last national election voted for Trump. Um, as the population continues to grow and diversify, do you think that Latinx oriented organizations, news outlets, and corporations will continue to homogenize? I'm assuming it probably would take several decades, but at some point, will that be a difficult process for them? Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about this too, this question of like, what is sort of the future? Um, and and here's where maybe, you know, some of, I'll have to update this sort of book in, in the future. Um, because, you know, on, on the one hand, there is has been a discussion within our field and also within sort of the left about, okay, well, how do we account for a difference within the Latinx community, right? Okay, so there's certainly privilege, right, in it. Um, there is similar colonialism in Latin America, right? So there's, by virtue of that, there are white or white passing Latinx people. Um, and I think that difference making is happening, right, uh, among the left. Um, and in the right, I think you'll see something similar, which is what happened at the beginning of um, the, um, uh, the 20th century, essentially, with immigrant groups from Italy and um, especially Italy, essentially where these quote unquote non-white, uh, or in that case, you know, Southern European voters were then slowly um, submerged into the white identity construct. And so whiteness itself as a, as a concept is very flexible. Um, and, and this is why whenever folks, I hear conversations about, oh, you know, well, there's gonna be more Latinx voters that automatically means more, um, you know, democratic votes. That's a big assumption if you, if you discard the fact that some Latinx 
people right now will probably start to view themselves as white or American um, in a few years. And I think you're already seeing that. Um, and that partially explains, I think, that's persistent 30% or so of folks who identify um, or vote Republican. Um, and to start to, to address your question more specifically, it's going to happen on digital media, right? I mean, dig digital media itself is a both a reifying and um, a sort of uh, it, it does this weird tendency to both reify things, but also like disaggregate them, right? Um, and so folks might be just be sort of tired of thinking about identity and say, you know what, I'm not worried about being Latinx anymore. I'm just going to be American. And, you know, if, if that means voting um, Republican, so be it, right? I want to, I want to get in the club. Uh, I think that that's partly what we'll see. It's hard to tell, um, but I think there is a somewhat of a backlash emerging against these kind of essentialized racial categories that we see in media right now. Uh, and that may rebound to the, the, the benefit of um, essentially the right. Thank you so much for addressing that. I was kind of thinking about that same notion as you were giving your presentation. It's almost as if the Latinx homogenized community will become like white adjacent, maybe not white, but there's like another category being formed that is becoming part of kind of like the dominant group. And of course it probably will take decades, yeah. but it's really interesting to see this mobilization towards that. Um, one of our attendees had a question about um, social class and the discursive construction of Latinx voters, yeah. um, specifically around expected ideologies and voting behavior. Yeah, yeah. Um, social class, I think, is the un kind of spoken aspect of, of being a, a Latinx person and voter in this in this country, um, you know, because there is a, a wide uh, difference, I think, in social class. I mean, you have all the way from folks who are essentially refugees, document migrants sort of constantly in fear of, um, you know, ICE and other agencies like that, um, you know, very much able to be um, essentially abused by, by, by uh, people that they're employed by. And then on the other hand, right, you have a legacy, especially here where I'm in South Texas um, uh, of, and, and throughout the nation as well, of people uh, who are Latinx who have been a part of this, you know, society for a long time and have deeply invested roots um, and um, essentially or maybe the boss of that, you know, uh, vulnerable Latinx person, right? And so when we flatten the identity, we disregard those kind of class conflicts. And, you know, I, for example, in Laredo here where I live, you know, you drive around the north end where I, I live and you see more Trump signs, you know, and if you drive further south, um, you know, you see less. And so I think partly, right, you know, the easy explanation for the different, for, for voting differences at least is often class. Um, and, and perhaps maybe if you were able to increase the uh, participation of sort of um, uh, those who are working class Latinx voters, the, the numbers would shift, of course. Um, and, and so the mirage, there may actually be a somewhat of a mirage baked into this 70-30 divide um, because essentially, you know, the 30% the that do vote Republican are all consistent voters. They've probably been voting for a long time um, and it's sort of baked in, right? Um, the other aspect of this to also address the question from, um, uh, I think it disappeared, but it was from Celeste, was, uh, is essentially that, um, you know, these organizations are also targeting a specific class in them of themselves, an educated class who want to become elites, but because of various factors of how the economy is structured um, and, uh, you know, sort of historical conditions, oversupply of labor, for example, are struggling, right? So these are your overeducated, underemployed folks. Um, and, you know, that's essentially there's an inter uh, interclass conflict right between the market based folks and the um, educated folks who want to sort of move into kind of those technical positions. Um, and essentially what you're leaving out is the vast uh, majority of, of, of working folks and that's essentially I mean explains democratic versus Republican politics to a large extent right I mean you're seeing the educated folks stick with uh, folks of higher degrees go Democrat. Uh, democratic and and um, and so everyone else, um, you have this weird hodgepodge on the right of working class voters who are primarily motivated by cultural issues, um, and then a, an elite essentially of uh, sort of uh, rich folks, um, and uh, those kind of trends are I think happening in, in the Latinx community as well. Thank you so much for deconstructing the homogenization that's going on regarding both class, but also like even those Tejanos in Texas where the border crossed them and how mm -hmm. they're might be different as well as just different areas. Um, one of our attendees has a question in terms of um, Latinx voters that are made up of digitally savvy, savvy possibly younger members um, and their use of 
um, Latino Hollywood celebrities. I think I'm misreading this. I yep. think um, they're asking in terms of if you have um, something like Voto Latino using um, Latinx celebrities as well as digital spaces, how are other Latinos that are not perhaps digital savvy being targeted or are they just not being targeted at all? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, this is, a, this is a very interesting question because this is the million dollar question for these organizations. How do you get people who don't vote to vote, right? Because that's their purpose. Um, and so, you know, the, um, the challenge I think is um, one, you know, the, the logic here is right, like what I said earlier, where they hope that the young digitally savvy will take this conversation to their familia, right, and encourage them to vote. Um, and, and this is something that I found in other research related to um, COVID misinformation, for example, that they hope that the young will take their message and reinforce it with their family. Um, I think in this case, um, you know, the, one of the, the challenges with, with, with non-voters is that um, for the large part, the message has been, you need to vote this way to defend your community, right? So there's an assumption, right, a, a, a priori that this community exists, first of all, and that they have certain interests. Um, and I think, you know, for the most part, the last four years have basically shown that that rhetorical appeal doesn't work, right, or, or is limited in a sense. Um, and, you know, I, I saw a post just a few minutes ago before I jumped on where I was saying um, to all my friends in the RGV, Rio Grande Valley in South Texas, who still continue to vote for Trump, how could you do this when you've seen X, Y, Z, right, all these things. And I, I get that sentiment totally. I 100% agree, you know, understand it. But I mean, it's if it doesn't seem to be working, you know, it's, I don't think shame and guilt are good electoral strategies. And this is partly what I argued in my piece uh, in the New York Times where I said, look, Bernie Sanders used a primarily economic pitch about it. Eco uh, job, good jobs, well-paying jobs, and healthcare. And he got the largest percentage of Latino and Latinx voters ever in a Democratic primary and, and turned out folks who don't normally vote. Um, and so I think this obsessive um, talk about immigration and sort of identity kind of politics aspects of it is not as productive as saying, look, Look, we, I want you to have a $15 minimum wage, and that's going to do a lot of good for you um, and give me more power sort of in your community as well. Um, and so, but I think they're resistant to that message, partly due to the corporatization of Latinx identity also, right? Um, so that, but that's, I, I don't, that's just a hunch on my half, on my part. I think that kind of goes back to Celeste's comment about social class, how social class might be what unites Latinx people versus more specific um, regional issues. Um, one of our attendees also talk, talked about how either um, Latinx oriented organizations such as Voto Latino uses, or how do they create this homogenizing rhetoric when, for example, you mentioned this in your book, Simon, you said it's an example. Um, you have both Mexicans and Mexican Americans yep. um, being angry at Trump for his rhetoric around um, you know, bad hombres being criminals, as well as like Puerto Rico with Hurricane Maria. Like, how do you how do they manage that in terms of homogenizing those two yeah. communities? I mean, I mean, to give a little bit of, uh, to give some credit certainly to these organizations, they do a lot of good work in their communities. Um, and, and one of the things that they constantly told me is that they're often sort of pushing back against their, um, you know, um, uh, sort of folks they work with in the Democratic Party or other organizations who assume that all Latinos are the same. So they themselves are also pushing back against this homogenization. They say, look, you cannot address essentially a third generation Tejano, South Texas, the same way you do a recent immigrant in Iowa, for example, right? Or a, for someone in, in South Florida who's a Cuban immigrant or second generation, perhaps the same way you do somebody who's an urban hipster, right, in LA, right? So um, they, they, to be fair, they also do that, um, that sort of pushback as well. Um, and I think, you know, um, if you look at, for example, the, the Trump campaign's rhetoric, um, they, uh, I just saw an ad that said Latinos gone Trump by something like that, but um, it used Cuban signifiers uh, because in their, in their imagination or however they see it, they realize that for what they need to win Florida, which is a critical state for them, um, it's all about getting the, the Cuban vote uh, out, right? Um, and that's what led to Al Gore losing Florida very narrowly in 2000. There's a great documentary on this on, on HBO Max, I recommend it called 537, I believe, that centers essentially the community, Cuban community's anger towards the Clinton administration about Elian Gonzalez and why that could explain why the margin was so narrow and eventually became a jump ball for the Republicans to win in the Supreme Court. 
Um, and so certainly, you know, the other side, uh, Republicans are aware of these differences um, and are sort of hyper targeting sort of the, um, uh, the at least the Cuban American vote in, in South Florida. And we only have a few more minutes and I wanted to give space to your students who I'm assuming they're students because they're very specific questions about Texas. <laughs> yeah. How are like major Latinx organizations approaching the Texas 23 election of Gonzalez and Ortiz Jones with various variables of Latinx and sexual orientation issues in relation to voting um, for the Democratic Party? Yeah, yeah. This is a, this is an interesting question. This is um, from a colleague of mine at, at Texas, uh, at Tammy and Dr. Kilburn. And to be honest, I don't totally know the district uh, or what's going on in it too well. I know it's one of those that is hoping to flip from Republican to uh, Democratic. Um, it was previously held by Will Hurd, who was a sort of moderate Republican, decided to retire. Um, Gonzalez is a Republican, and Ortiz Jones is the Democrat in this case. Texas 23 starts in El Paso and runs this giant, like, in a sort of very rural part of West South Texas. Um, and I drive through it every time I drive from uh, Laredo to, um, to El Paso. And, and all I could say, I think, in this case is that, um, you know, uh, this is an example where there's a, a very specific local race where both happen to be um, Latino, Hispanic. And you see, I think, in both of their presentations of themselves as candidates, some of these kind of controversies I'm talking about. So that's my kind of cop out answer. I would look at, I, I think Ortiz Jones is probably going to win. Um, but uh, it's a very rural district. And so what it means to be Latinx in that district is very different, of course, than what it means in you know, New York City, for example. Um, I had one, this question is actually from an attendee, but it kind of made me think. We've talked about social class. We've talked about mm -hmm. different ethnic nationalities. Um, how does gender factor in? Like, is there a difference yeah. how they target men, women, those that are non-gender binary? Um, you know, I haven't seen, um, I, I don't remember seeing much, and, and partly this is my data that comes from about a year or two ago, a lot of focus on um, really gender differences, and that perhaps might be somewhere where they are going in a direction. Um, what, what the exit polls are showing um, in, uh, or not the exit polls, sorry, some of the polling, and I'm glad uh, this commenter brought it up because I think it's really important, is that yeah, there is a gender difference. The, the the Latino voters who are Latinx voters who are sticking with Trump or actually maybe showing some interest in him are mostly men, right? Uh, sort of cisgendered uh, men, and I think there is an aspect in it of machismo, right? Uh, because um, you know, I drive around, for example, here in, in South Texas, and they have you know folks are driving these big giant trucks with the big Texas flag. Uh, sorry, the big Trump flag. And I view that sort of as a expression of, I can control you or I can dominate you, right? And that's a big aspect of the machismo kind of element here. And, it's, and it may be class, maybe they, they're doing well for themselves, but if they don't have the class aspect, right? If, if Trump has not been good for them in terms of taxes, they do have the part of, well, Trump pisses off the people I don't like, which is my educated cousin who went to you know, UT and came back you know, and annoys me now saying, I I'm, I'm, you know, do all these bad things. And I can use my identity as a Trump voter, uh, as a left and not next Trump voter, to piss them off, essentially, right? And say, uh, you know, you know, screw you, essentially. I like them no matter what. Uh, and I, so I think that cultural aspect is a part of it. And without a stronger economic message from either, you know, side here, um, all we will have left is these cultural who who pisses off the other side more. And I think our politics is really just poorer for that in general, right? If we're not talking about things that actually matter to folks, I mean. We only had one $1,200 check this whole pandemic. I mean, and we've been arguing about, you know, silly stuff. And so um, I guess I'll conclude there. And this is probably what I'll probably talk about also in our, in our Q&A. But I think losing sight of those economic and class elements um, is a detrimental for all of us, um, no matter what. So thank you all for your questions. Um, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you thank so much. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry, Krista, go ahead, please. You're fine. I was just thanking him. <laughs> So I was going to thank you uh, first, Crystal, for impeccable moderation. Truly, truly excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Arthur, for a great seminar and a super engaging Q&A. Uh, we had great turnout today, and I'm very, very pleased to see that. It is a very special day today, Selection Day. So um, I want to thank all attendees for taking time uh, 
to discuss uh, this very important work with one of the rising stars in the field. But I also want to remind them if they haven't voted yet, please go and vote. This is very, very important. Happens every four years. It's a particularly important election. So if you haven't gone out there to vote, and if you're in the US, please vote. Uh, other than that, I want to thank again Crystal Arthur, all the attendees. Wish everybody a great rest of your days and week. And I uh, hope to see uh, all or most of you in the next uh, seminar of the Center for uh, Latinx Digital Media at Northwestern University, when Claudia Meliado next uh, Tuesday from Pontificia Universidad Católica in Valparaíso, Chile, uh, will present her work on role performance and journalism. Thank you very much for joining us again and have a great rest of your days. Thank you all.